Welcome to Why Adding an Index Can Make a Query Slower. I'm Kendra Little from SQLWorkbooks.com. We normally think of indexes as a terrific tool to make our queries faster in SQL Server. And that's for good reason. When we craft an index, we are giving the SQL Server optimizer a way to limit I.O., limit CPU use often, and dramatically speed up a query. So when indexing works well, they are helpful to the optimizer, our queries become faster, and the indexes are very, very valuable. But sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes you'll create an index, and for either the query that you're tuning or maybe for some other query entirely, the query uses the index and hits a regression and becomes slower. We can have these cases where we create an index that we, we're putting it there we're, and we're allocating space to speed up performance, but it makes our performance worse. And either we're wasting space with the index or we just look and feel kind of dumb. Now, there's reasons why this happens and the more indexes you tune, eventually this will happen to you because you can't index every query perfectly. If you try to, in most systems, we have so many different queries that run with different joins and different where clauses and different columns in the select that we can't create the perfect indexes tailored for each of these queries. When we create new row store indexes in SQL Server, we're creating, with these disk-based row store indexes, we're creating a separate copy of the columns that we're indexing. The columns that we specify as the keys and the included columns get their whole new beautiful structure. And this structure can be really useful, but the more we put in there, the more space it takes up. If we indexed every query, the size of our database would just explode with all these disk-based row store indexes because this copy of data is gonna take up storage. When SQL Server reads it into memory and its buffer pool, it's gonna take up our memory and we're gonna to have to maintain them too. We need to check them and make sure they don't get corrupt. We need to deal with fragmentation or they'll just expand with all this empty space in them. And we've gotta back them up so that we don't lose data. So this means that usually we are going to work hard to tailor really efficient indexes for our most important queries. But for our less important queries, and honestly, everywhere we can get away with it, we're going to let SQL Server use less than perfect indexes. We're not gonna try to cover all the columns in every query or have the perfect index keys for every query. We're going to often let the SQL Server Optimizer make the best of what it has, and it can be pretty good at making the best of what it has. In this situation, I'm gonna show you a case where it's not that great of making the best at what it has. And we'll have a problem query where it's not the fastest query in the world, but its performance suffers after we add a non-clustered index because SQL Server decides to use the non-clustered index and it's not always great for our query. You'll get to take a challenge. So you'll get to look at the problem. And if you want to, you can then take a crack at it yourself. You can grab the T-SQL and work on it and try to figure out why is it getting slower and can I change the T-SQL to speed it up? Now I say change the T-SQL, this is not an indexing challenge. You could absolutely take it that way and improve the index and say, okay, how can I make you faster this way? But in this session, what I'm focusing on is, okay, what if I have to deal with a less than perfect indexing scenario and I can only change the T-SQL, can I tune it to at least get back to how fast I was before, even if it isn't perfect? And for different solution, what are the pros and cons of those solutions? because there are trade-offs when we are tuning our queries in SQL Server. The data that we'll be looking at today is sample data of baby names. Now I got the original data set from data.gov, the United States government 
releases each year aggregate information about all the baby names that were born. And by aggregate, I mean it gives you, for the year, the total number of babies with a given name, let's say Jacob, it gives you, for, the, for Jacob, for a given gender, what was the total count of names. Now, I've taken that data and I've made a bunch of fake data with it because I wanted to create a detail table with a lot of rows. The detail table is on the right here. It's dbo.firstnamebybirthdate. 1966 to 2015. And it has a row for every baby born that I have state level data from that says which state in the United States it was from. So each of those babies has their own row that specifies the birth year, a fake, some fake columns <laughs> based, I don't know exactly the minutes they were born, so I faked it out. The state code they were in, the first name ID, an integer, representing what their name is and then their gender. We have another table, ref.firstname, which is re much smaller. Ref.firstname is only 0 0.003 gigs and 95,000 rows. It just lists, okay, what are the first names? How long is the name? When was it first and last reported? And then it's got the total name count. But the reason I have this detail table is it's 3.7 gigs and it's 159 million rows. As the data in our tables grow, we get more and more interesting challenges with our queries for optimization. So I, we have data actually going back to 1880. I just picked the data from 66 to 2015 to give us a reasonably sized table to play around with. Next up, we're gonna dive in and explore that problem query.